As I did for the introduction in the Chivieco book, I'm going to run through our other text of the week, these slides from Dr. John Jensen, um, and offer my thoughts on them. So I'm kind of going to emphasize some things that are important, um, supplement what's in the slides with um, kind of the thoughts that they prompt in my mind as I see them, and to give you a context for why um, this was there in the first place. This was there in the first place because it was used in uh, prior iterations of this course at AUM. I decided to keep it in because I think, I think that while remote sensing is a field that you know, it's, it's constantly uh, under technological development, you know, see, see new things coming out all the time, new sensors, new ways of doing things. Um, sometimes, at, especially for the introduction to this practice, this field, it's better to look away from the present to the see or, they see or hear the opinions of those who were around as the field first developed. And John Jensen is one of these people. As you can see on the first slide, Jensen was a professor in geography at the University of South Carolina. He retired just around the point when I was starting out in grad school. Um, I think he kept on as an editor to a journal and was in fact the, the person who I communicated with on the first journal article that I submitted. Um, Jensen wrote a few textbooks that we don't use in this course. <laughs> I don't mean to kind of cast aspersions on those. Um, just uh, to say that he has kind of a comprehensive view, full view of the field and that these materials were developed for, as you can see, kind of uh, two courses at South Carolina. So Jensen begins by describing uh, something that activities that are very important to the kind of the practice of remote sensing, but that might not be initially associated with the field, and that being in situ measurements of variables or values of variables um, in support of remote sensing measurement. So kind of examples of here we see on slide four, in situ measures of leaf area index kind of the two-dimensional surface of leaf area over a given area of ground. And then on the right in that image, a spectroradiometer. So this is the kind of sensor that you see on a lot of passive multispectral sensors, where what's being measured is reflected sunlight in various different wavelengths of light. Some other measurements here, a spectroradiometer at left and then a, a GPS measurement at right. Luckily, we don't have those backpacks anymore, at least not for um, many applications. Phone is good enough. And here on slide six, describe two ways in which data need to be calibrated. One is geometrically and radiometrically. Um, so here we describe geometric in terms of the elevation, latitude, longitude, for instance. Radiometric means how sensitive are those instruments to reflected sunlight? Can they measure a difference of, uh, you know, 1% of incoming light? Uh, is that the level of precision or is it 0.1%, 0.01% and so on? The second is that these in situ measurements are necessary in order to calibrate measurements from remote sensors, that is to say, to set up the algorithms from which actual measurements of light are, are uh, from which are derived uh, measurements about surface properties. Also, uh, not mentioned here, but maybe later on is validation. So after those algorithms are calibrated in one location or in a few locations, how do those algorithms fare in others, do they accurately describe what's on the surface or not? 
So in situ measurement in support of remote sensing is incredibly important because it really is, it allows us to take advantage of the benefits of remote sensing. And I talked a little bit about those, how Chudieko lists them out. They're, they're in contrast to what you can do with in situ measurements, but they don't stand alone either. You might hear uh, the word scale being said, and scale can refer to kind of uh, your vantage point, how you're looking at things as a noun. You might also hear, hear the word scale used as a verb, and here it describes the interpolation or extrapolation, the kind of extension of measurements at certain places to describe phenomena in other places where you don't have measurements. So that this is something that you can do using remotely sensed data that can be globally comprehensive. They can have a wide synaptic view. Um, they could be measured repeatedly over time. But in order to really understand what the sensors are showing us, these in situ measurements are so important. Here on slide seven, Jensen emphasizes through use of vocabulary the fact that error can affect in situ field data collection just as much as it can kind of direct from the sensor data. It can affect it in different ways, but it can render it non-useful to us. And so especially back then, and these slides are probably about 12, 15 years old, in my guess, 10 or 15 maybe. Um, people used to call in situ data the ground truth data. And people don't really say that as much anymore. It's kind of acknowledged uh, the error that affects those data. Rather, you hear things, you hear that data being described as ground reference data, maybe calibration validation data, kind of with reference to the activity uh, or the reason why you're collecting it. Oh. Here are some problems, uh, ways that error can find its way and affect your in-situ data collection. So next on slide nine here, move into kind of definitions of remote sensing. The first, uh, the diagram comes from Jensen himself, the quote from Colwell, who I believe was with the US Forest Service for a while. Um, the measurement or acquisition of information of some property of an object or phenomenon by a recording device that is not in physical or intimate contact with the object or phenomenon under study. And then next here, Jensen uh, kind of lists the ASPRS. This is the, uh, the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. So it's a professional organization. They've adopted kind of a, a somewhat different definition, the art, science, and technology of obtaining reliable information about physical objects and the environment through the process of recording, measuring, and interpreting imagery and digital representations of energy patterns derived from non-contact sensor systems. So I don't know, I, I, these definitions are kind of helpful in a descriptive sense, but it seems to me that they might be, uh, I don't know, they might be unclear in a big picture sense, as in they're tied too closely to um, what people who practice remote sensing are doing in the year 1997 or in you know 15 years ago. Um, not to say that they're out of date, but I think the field of remote sensing, the activity, it's always it's kind of struggled with um, clear definitions, partly because it's intuitive kind of in the outgrowth, as I talked about with Chuvieco, the outgrowth from just the human eye and interface um, to being a constantly evolving practice. These next few slides, is remote sensing a science? Is it an art? I mean, I think there are kind of reasonable, reasonable arguments for both of those. I think the best way to think about remote sensing is as a way of doing. It's as a way of knowing, a way to find things out and to plan studies. And just to mention, I don't really know what Jensen's going at with these slide 14 and 15. 
Maybe they live beyond me. I think the next few slides are interesting as getting the thoughts from Jensen. And then finally, I'll end just looking at these two process diagrams. And this is kind of an older and a newer version of the remote sensing process, kind of the 2004 version being a little bit beefed up. So we'll look at that. So if you look at the boxes at top and the arrows leading from the first step of that process, statement of the problem, you could also think of that as kind of the, as the first bullet under that, kind of the hypothesis. On to data collection, data to information conversion, and information presentation. So data information, these are kind of terms. Data is what the sensor provides, the measurements that are made. But in order to have, be meaningful for people, whether they're scientists, uh, or any old person who's interested in their environment, businesses, government, what have you, that the, in order to become meaningful data to them, me, data must become converted to information. So we'll look over here, statement of the problem, steps involved with that, formulating the hypothesis, Selecting the logic. So this is kind of how you how you take the observations that you have and make them relevant to the process that you are interested in. And it kind of, you can do it in different ways. You can kind of start with the cases that you observe in a concrete real sense and extrapolate to a general sense, or you could take your broader understandings and from those work down to come up with expectations of what individual observations should be. Once your kind of hypothesis is established and your logic declared at least, and it, you might you know, go back and forth in working from concrete examples to general principles, um, you need to come up with ways of collecting data. And we'll discuss ways that data collection campaigns have been planned and executed, and we'll certainly make use of some of the data that have been collected from them. Um, data collection here can, it means a few things. You know, we see one bullet, the in-situ measurements, that to calibrate or validate models or other observations made from sensors. Collateral data, Another term for that is ancillary data. It describes data that's already been collected, not necessarily for your project in particular, but that should have some relevance toward it. So this could be elevation. And elevation doesn't change much in many places over kind of time scales that are relevant to people. So mostly we all use digital elevation models, data on elevation, uh, from a very few sources. Similarly for soil, geology, and things like population density. Finally, for remote sensing, it's, um, it's more rare, but it's not impossible that you'd actually kind of design sensors, buy sensors, borrow them, I, I don't know, and collect data yourself. Here, data collection might not mean you know, going out and flying uh, alongside your sensor in an airplane, it might refer to kind of where do you download your data from? Um, what dates are you interested in? What areas uh, in the world? And so on. Next step, this third column, data to in information conversion. Jensen makes the distinction between analog or visual image processing and digital image processing. I think a lot of what we'll do outside of maybe topic five will have to do with digital image processing. Um, if you hear the term photogrammetry, a lot of that, I mean, there's digital image processing that's necessary for photogrammetry, uh, but also um, maybe the features kind of the real world things that are attempted to be resolved um, 
in data, maybe the resolution of the data, lend themselves more toward uh, visual image processing. We'll get into analog or visual image processing, but spend a lot of time on digital image processing. So I think, I mean, it's a little bit confusing when remote sensing is one of the topics in the remote sensing process. But when you think about what's going to be in a class, uh, my expectations anyway would be more remote sensing, data collection, digital image processing. In terms of this course, we'll cover all that. We'll spend a little bit of time on the statement of problem, just as, in so much as we tackle problems for weekly lab exercises or in the final exercise. We'll also dedicate a topic toward accuracy assessment. So this being understanding whether or not the data that we chose, the processing steps that we implemented actually give us uh, an answer, a definitive answer uh, to our hypothesis. And it's important, kind of the arrows only go one way here, but it's important to note that arrows should, can, uh, unfortunately will loop back. And yet your first idea about where, when, really how to analyze a landscape may not be the best way to do it. And you might find that out. And it's good to find that out. You might not think it's great to have to redo work or to go back to an earlier step in the process, but you know that's the way that you learn and that's the way that you avoid mistakes in the future.